Welcome to Transformative Principle, where you learn how to be a leader and not just a manager of a to-do list. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. This week, I am launching a special workshop for reopening schools. If you would like to be part of that, it is not too late. So please go to jethrojones.com slash reopen to join this awesome workshop about reopening our schools this fall. That's jethrojones.com slash reopen. This week's episode is brought to you by John Cat Educational. You can get a discount on the awesome books that they have available by going to us.johncatbookshop.com and using the code transformative30. That'll save you 30% on any order. That's us.johncatbookshop.com and the code is transformative30. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am super excited to have Eric Kalenz on the program. Welcome to Transformative Principle, Eric. Thanks for having me, Jethro. Pleasure to be here. Great. And I am excited to talk to you. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about your background and, you know, Cliff Notes version, not the uh, War and Peace version? <laughs> <laughs> and full warning, I almost don't do a Cliff Notes version of anything. So, uh, <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> you can politely interrupt me at any time. Uh, but basically, it goes like this I uh, began as a classroom teacher, high school English, football coach, uh, journalism advisor, all those things. Uh, left the classroom, started to go into more leadership type roles. Uh, in around 2013, I decided I wanted to try writing a book, like kind of putting some things together uh, that I was observing uh, through all those experiences. That led me kind of into this idea of, of really trying to help educators around the country uh, become a little bit more evidence informed in their decision making, planning and instruction. Uh, uh, that book was called Education is Upside Down. Uh, that also led to me becoming involved in this international organization called Research Ed, which is very much dedicated to building educators, research literacy, and just you know their, their use of evidence informed instructional practices. After a number of those conferences that I've organized in the U.S. and spoken at internationally, uh, I wrote a second book, and that's that's kind of the reason uh, we became connected, Jethro, and that's called What the Academy Taught Us, uh, and that's the one that came out in October, I think, of, of this past year. And yeah, I'm I'm a writer, I'm a, a teacher, and a curriculum and instruction lead at a charter school here in the Twin Cities Metro. Uh, and I'm the U.S. ambassador to research it. Cool. So, like, you got a lot going on. I want to focus in on one piece, which is the idea of being evidence informed. That's not a phrase we typically hear tossed around. So, what does that mean? Uh, well, it's kind of a loaded term at this point, and I talk about that with a number of people. On the one hand, it's it's looking at what has worked in education. Okay, so like uh, initiatives or interventions that have. Uh, pretty verifiably uh, been put into a district uh, or and or school and generated positive results. You know, so we have evidence that a certain program, a certain approach has worked. Okay? That's evidence based in one sense. I'm almost more fascinated, though, with evidence based in another sense. And that's like planning instruction according to the evidence we have from, say, cognitive science or behavioral science. So when we know, for instance, uh, things like it's fairly cut and dry that that students who have higher stores of, of background knowledge do better in reading comprehension, critical thoughts, things like that. That's a cognitive scientific finding. We have evidence to base our instruction on that we can change our instruction according to. So it's right now, I, I would say we almost have a we have a little bit of an issue right now <laughs> when it comes to evidence-based instruction in that if you ever throw the term around, people will often argue and say, well, uh, well, there's contrary evidence that that reading program didn't work in another district. And it's like, yes, yes. But, but I'm really talking about the evidence from cognitive science that can tell us more about how people learn, okay, and tuning our instruction more to that and thinking about uh, quote unquote programs that worked. So it's, it's both and right now. And that 
does make it a little confusing, but that again is why research ed exists is to basically say what is evidence based, what's not. When when a consultant blows in, and, and I, I may go on here for a second, but when, when a consultant blows in and says uh, this is an evidence based program, we're hoping that more practitioners will be in the room with more evidence critical eyes and say. Okay, well, show me the evidence that that this program can work that we're about to spend ten million dollars on over the next four years. You know, uh, to just question it because I think if you really do peel back the onion, uh, uh, <laughs> you'll find that a lot of the evidence, the so-called evidence, like supporting many of the the decisions that are made, are actually not all that evidence sound. Uh, and yeah. so that's what we're trying to do is is is, is just create more and more evidence critical eyes in the room. Yeah. So evidence-based can mean that there's evidence that this has worked. And what you'd like it to emphasize more is that there, there is evidence that this agrees with cognitive science about how people learn. Is that a fair summary of that? Uh, much more so. Yep. Okay. When we talk about what has worked, that's an incredibly context dependent concept. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So like, like what works if you really look into the studies and you start to look at, well, was the, was the sample of kids tested representative of, you know, my district? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, was the sample of kids tested large enough? And was it representative enough of the setting it was in? All those things like those, that's, that's like research literacy 101. Okay. Right. And so how do you, how do you train people to look at what's worked more critically? That's a long-term project, but uh, when it comes to how people learn, that's almost preferable in that uh, humans learn incredibly similarly to one another, <laughs> no matter our backgrounds. There are little things we, and, and so we can count on that a bit more if we make our decisions a bit more according to that. Little things like sometimes get demonized, for instance, in, in education, like the idea of, of repetition or, you know, rote practice being like uh, thought of as this, you know, drudgery type activity. But it's like, well, you know, cognitive scientifically, it turns out that the more you do practice something, the, the, the better the chance it's going to actually work into your long term memory. And, and practice may never make perfect, but practice can make permanent. <laughs> and if there are certain facts that we think are important to know, you know, maybe going over them, you know, quite a few times is the best way to ensure that they will stick. That That's a, like a, that's the, a very boiled down, like cognitive scientific finding uh, that, that a lot of people avoid, but that just tends to be how humans work as anyone who's ever, you know, played piano will tell you and had to practice their scales or anyone who's ever, you know, uh, played tennis and hit a lot of forehands, you know, <laughs> like, like the more times you practice something, the, the movements just become, you know, absolutely ingrained in our, in our system. Uh, so, so that's one of the things is, is humans learn very certain ways. There are certain things we can do with our instruction every single day that can uh, enable those processes for kids. And that's a little bit more what I'm focused on is how do we learn? Uh, how do humans on average and in the main learn uh, and how can we integrate those sorts of things into our daily practice? That's, that's my evidence-based, you know, leaning is, is more toward how does the, the average human learn, not necessarily on, you know, which curriculum is the best or, yeah. <laughs> or yeah. you know. Yeah. So the, the idea of, of being evidence informed makes me feel like, oh, that means I have to read a whole bunch more or know a whole bunch more. And I'm just barely struggling getting through, you know, preparing for my class each day. What's, what's your answer to that when it seems like learning a whole nother field is too much for me, but that's what it feels like to know how, how cognitive science says that people do learn. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. And that, oh, I love that question because I, that's the big challenge I think for the field right now is, is how might you, for a, a very busy and a very put upon field already train, sorry, retrain them on the run, uh, you know, uh, on things like this, that's nearly impossible. And that's, that's one of the things like when it comes to, you know, my passion for, you know, the research ed movement and definitely in my writing and things like that is, is this is not 
in any way urging teachers to get their noses in all the research studies they can. Okay. I, I know that as a teacher myself, <laughs> that's, that's close to impossible. Okay. But it is very much incumbent on the system leaders to figure out how to make their professional development, like provide easily translated, easily digested ways of understanding what they need to understand and then how to integrate that into practice. Like, uh, and I, I can give one example, the charter I'm at right now, for instance, there's no way with everything where we have going on, uh, I could retrain this entire staff in all there is to know about cognitive science to make them be more mindful of their planning. But I can do things like I, I was able to uh, have, a, have a huge hand in like kind of redesigning our entire teacher coaching and evaluation process and things like that. And then the questions that coaches ask, coaches and administrators ask of teachers built, baked into that entire process is kind of like asking teachers, okay, so we know that building background knowledge is incredibly important in the lesson I'm about to see. What new will the kids learn about the world today? Okay. And if the teachers maybe like, you know, a little like deer in the headlights on that sort of thing. Sorry, deer in the headlights. Do you guys say that in Oklahoma? In Alaska? Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, Alaska. Sorry, in the headlights. Okay, sorry. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Uh, here it's a deer in the headlights. Uh, uh, yeah. but if, if, the teacher, if the teacher's deer in the headlights and, and says, why, no, I, I just had this interesting project planned. Okay. And we say, well, you know, we have a premium on, we're always looking out the window and not just in the mirror. Okay. Like we don't mm -hmm. just want to start with the, the facts the kids have, because we know that, you know, part of you know, effective reading comprehension, part of effective critical thought is constantly adding to their store of background knowledge. If the, the school admin is constantly asking teachers, tell me what new they will know or be exposed to before they, you know, before the end of the lesson, I'm about to see that kind of like feeds this process all the time. So like there are little systemic ways we can constantly be talking about these cognitive scientific principles that don't necessarily mean we're going to run off long studies and you all are going to read them and you're going to become, you're going to become, you know, more, you know, like erudite in the, the domain of educational and psychological research, you know, that, that seems unreasonable, but I think that's where we need to focus is, is in what ways can systems always make sure that's kind of what their, what their PD is about is, is, and, and their, and, you know, importantly, their coaching and evaluation and other developmental processes that aren't necessarily like learning type PD. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm thinking about when I was a curriculum specialist, our department was called evidence-based learning. And mm -hmm. when we created professional development, I mean, I wouldn't say that we were perfect at it, but we certainly made a very intentional decision to focus on those things that were in alignment with how people learn. And they were innovative teaching practices, but they were also on the one hand, but they were also very basic, clear things that everybody needs to be able to do, you know? And so it was, it was really exciting to be part of that because we could see the change in classrooms almost immediately. And, and you could see kids getting it when you would watch a teacher do the things that we had taught in the professional development that we ran in ways that they just didn't get it before. And, Boy, that is so inspiring <laughs> when you can do that because it's easy to do a new program or something and have it just be a total, total flop. But when you're doing things that you know work, then it makes you feel much more motivated and able to actually get it done. Absolutely. And, and I think that, and I mean, and just what you're describing there, that's almost exactly where I'm coming from with, especially with uh, the most recent book and then the, the continuing work with research ed is like, mm -hmm. we're not necessarily um, promoting the idea of you bring in a whole new set of tools, you know, for, for teachers to use and get more like, you know, facile to, with using, but more like, okay, guys, given, given the tools you currently have. Okay. Cause sometimes, you know, like an entire curriculum or, or, or a year's worth of training like that becomes really hard to secure. What are some 
some principles about how people learn that can always inform the little things you do. Okay, so I, I can speak for myself as a high school English teacher. That's, that's what I am by trade. Uh, when I learned what I did about background knowledge, and I hate to keep going to that because there's much more to cognitive science than background knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but as an English teacher, I realized, you know, a lot of my kids, you know, when I, when I did the reading of, of E.D. Hirsch and many others, I'm like, that's true. You know, my kids maybe aren't grasping the, the literature I want them to simply because they don't know enough about what I'm talking about and writers leave gaps. Okay. So I'm like, okay, I can wait for the perfect textbook series to be adopted by my district, but that's on a seven year loop, you know, <laughs> for a very practical yeah. reasons. They, they can't go get me, you know, $15,000 worth of materials because I'm one teacher in a massive district. Uh, but uh, I can do a little bit of legwork and I can make sure that every single time I introduce a piece, I give them enough front loading about, okay, here's where the piece is set. Here's who the author was. Here's what the author typically focused on in their career. You know, here, yeah, and I could give them the, that background knowledge. Uh, and I was amazed just how much they were grasping in terms of themes and, uh, you know, the author's message and, uh, and the actual plot. I mean, they were, they were picking up things so much better, you know, just from me giving a short introduction, you know, a, a very explicitly taught, you know, uh, I, I didn't let them discover what the meaning of the piece was, you know, <laughs> like, like, cause when they discovered, it was like, well, they're really grasping on at, at nothing. If I'm talking about a piece set in Western Africa in, you know, the mid 19th century, there's no way they're going to know those things. I have to explicitly install those. Now let's read it. And then you just, as you described, Jethro, like you can just watch the light bulbs come on. Like, yes, this is that, like that thing you were saying. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and then, and then I realized how they can deal, you know, uh, much more effectively with the big picture themes, uh, just from me taking that small step. Now that was on me as a teacher, but I think, uh, many teachers would, you know, uh, groove on similar ideas if they were just kind of informed of how crucial those pieces are to to how we learn and how we put information together. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So let's talk a little bit about your recent book, which is what the Academy taught us. Tell us about the premise of that book and what we need to learn from it. Well, the the, the first thing is my first book was really pretty pretty academic. Uh, the second book, I was like, eh, I don't think I want to go maybe as academic, but I want to talk about something that I thought was kind of crucial in, in American education, especially uh, based on my experiences. Uh, and that was uh, in the work I was doing with schools around the country. Uh, I was really seeing a lot of uh, principals, especially feeling hemmed in by things their district was doing. Okay. Like I don't have a lot of autonomy to make my own decisions. I'm, you know, this is what our district focuses and things like that. And I realized that's really an outgrowth of kind of the the No Child Left Behind movement and just a lot of uh, reform and change and improvement being really centrally driven. Uh, and then I started to think about that and lay that on top of my own experience. And I was really very much at a school that was in the throes of that when I was a teacher. And just as I was leaving the classroom, that was very much like encroaching on the school. But before that happened, that school uh, did have an, a remarkable amount of autonomy for reasons that are described in the book. And it was highly inspirational to me. Okay. Like it, it powered everything I'm doing now. I had an amazing principal uh, who was a visionary and a great communicator and a great relationships person with his staff. Uh, and when, and, and I'm like, hmm, maybe I could kind of tell the tale of that school and how they made changes at a very local level before all of this like district level encroachment started to happen, which was kind of a late you know, the first decade of the 2000s, that's when that really started to take hold, I think, in America. And so here was a school that was doing some really positive things. And uh, it's it's the tale of, of what we did before that and, and our struggles, too. I mean, we didn't get it perfect, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I had a real catbird seat at, at that, whole, that whole movement and then watched it just sort of crumble, uh, as it has in many, many, many schools uh, across the country. So it's the tale of that school. And then obviously I, I actually went and interviewed a lot of kids who were part of some of the changes that we made, which is 
uh, great fun, by the way, talking to them now at, at like, you know, 27, 30 years old, uh, you know, so what kind of difference did this make in your life? What kind of this difference did it make in your high school tra- trajectory? Uh, did we make a difference, you know, uh, and that was just highly inspirational uh, for me uh, as I was putting it together. Uh, but then the book kind of like transitions into, uh, all right, that's an object lesson in this bigger thing that I'm observing in America. And so when we talk about continuous school improvement, like how in light of that school's experience and the national experience, we might want to think about continuous school improvement going ahead. John Cat Educational supports high quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. Visit us.johncatbookshop.com to see the latest publications whose exciting ideas include overcoming the extrovert ideal in our schools, creating bottom up transformation that promotes buy in from all educators, and improving formal and informal continuous learning opportunities for teachers. These books, used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide, amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes. So would you share one of those stories of one of the kids that you interviewed? Because that, talk about evidence, right? That's a kid, this is, yeah. this is how it helped me or didn't help me. And we all have our stories about education and how it did or didn't help us. I certainly have my own uh, experiences with it, but share one of those, uh, stories of one of those kids. Right. Well, and, and before I do, I mean, like, that's one of the, uh, I'd like to like very much, uh, draft behind something you just said, Jethro. And that's, uh, I don't know that enough research has been done on kids post the K-12 experience. Yeah. It's like, uh, for all the things we say we're doing that, that is making learning happen and all those things, it's like the rubber of, of schooling does not truly hit the road until the kids are done with school. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's only after you like actually hit like post K-12 reality, whether that's college for you or, or the workplace or your relationships after high school or, or, or whatever, uh, that we see if we succeeded. Uh, and so I was kind of fascinated by that question as I was talking to these kids, as I was like, I, our whole goal was, was on, you know, we were thinking about, post K-12 success all the time. We wanted them to graduate, um, but, you know, like it doesn't really matter if what we felt, if what we were doing and we felt great about it, uh, it, that would be nice, you know, and if they passed all their standardized tests, that would also be nice. But really, you know, 10 years out, guys, how do you look back on this experience, you know? And and I just got to several, several kids uh, who were like, that was a huge turning point for me in that I was close to calling it a day on schooling and you all kind of pulled us back from the brink, you know, like I just heard it over and over and over, whether it was in interviews or surveys. So I, I would just like to throw out there as long as I'm <laughs> in the, in this format, like uh, I think many times when we look for things like deeper learning, we look at what's happening in a classroom and I'm like, no, no, no. I think what we really need to do is ask the kids who are subject to deeper learning type environments or what have you, five, six years out from their experience and say, did your deeper learning experience five or six years ago in a high school classroom pay dividends for you as a college student, as, you know, someone hitting the job market and whatnot. But anyway, I, uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book, uh, I start the whole book with, and I, as long as you asked, I start the book with the tale of a, a fight that happened. Um, there was a, I had a student <laughs> who, uh, was being bullied by some senior girls. There was a girl, a girl who was being bullied by some senior girls, and she was a member of our academy, the sophomore academy. It was, you know, students who were really on the edge of, of not not doing so well. And she started skipping a lot of school. And, and when we started asking around to other academy students, they were like, uh, they weren't saying anything because you know the whole like snitch rule among uh, adolescents. Uh, but one day I'm standing outside my classroom and just kind of, you know, yucking it up with students and things like that. And there was a full on attack of another girl right in front of me. Okay. Now this, this happens, you know, decently often in a, you know, urban area, high school and whatever. So it's a fight. What, but when I recognize who it is, it's like all my kids are jumping this one girl. 
and I break the fight up and I secured the, the senior girl and I got her in, in, into my classroom and I knew her well because she had been a student of mine two years ago and she's looking very stunned. I don't think she'd ever been punched in the face before. And I'm like, you good? Okay. And I had another teacher kind of take care of her. I run after the students. I fly down the stairs and all of my kids who just done this like assault are waiting at the bottom of the stairs for me. And I, I'm like, and I, then that, you know, caught me off guard because I was like, what are you waiting for me for? But what they did then is they did that very much on purpose. They, they jumped the girl in front of me. They told their story to me. And that was, she's one of the bullies who's, you know, bullying this other person in the academy. And no one in the academy is going to get punked like that, as it was their words. And I was, you know, knocked fully off guard because uh, the girl that they were defending, I'm like, you guys don't even, you don't even hang with her. You know, it, it, it seemed uh, uh, weird. You know, they were there. They were very much on the other side of the room from this girl. And they're like, it doesn't matter. We're all we're all academy, you know, uh, and that really hit me. Uh, like, I think I don't like what I just saw. <laughs> and I don't like that this is the type of justice these kids are meeting out. But it was one of those moments where it was like, I think we've created an amazing community through this thing uh, that they were at first very resistant to in that kids were reaching way across their like neighborhood and class and racial guidelines to stand up for each other. And, and, and that's when that was really powerful for me. And then, and then in, the, in the book, it goes on to, to talk about, uh, how I escorted those kids. To, well, first, how I coached them about how they were going to talk to admin. And I basically pointed out to them, like, you are going to, you are most, uh, I'm like, from what I witnessed, you are going to get a three-day suspension. You are going to get a five-day suspension. <laughs> you were, like, I saw it all. And they were like, got it, got it. And they just, like, accepted their medicine, you know. Uh, but then I walked them down to the principal's office, went to our discipline person, an AP named Brian. And I, I said, this is the, I'm like, and I coach the kids, don't say anything. Don't explode yet. I'm like, tell them where you're coming from. But after I do the, the intake, you know, if you will. And he was, I'll never forget. He was just wide eyed. Like, how can this be happening? You know, like, how can we have five kids who just did something really, really violent, completely calm, letting one of our adults speak for them. Uh, and he did, he just like, he, he wrote them up, sent them home one at a time. Uh, the kids, we were eventually able to work that into a mediation to get everybody like, we're going to have to learn to coexist. Okay. Uh, and the bullying from the seniors is going to stop. Okay. The 10th graders have taken their punishment. Uh, and it, and it was like, it was a really remarkable moment. And one of the things that really sticks out to me, you know, uh, a decade or more out is uh, <laughs> one of the nights that I had, I had focus groups that I hosted while I was putting it together. And one of the nights, four of the kids from that event showed up together and they might be some of the closest to this day of them all. <laughs> like, 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 and they're, they're 30 years old. Uh, they remain in touch, all these things. And it's just like, you know, I think, I think the community that was created there a, among a bunch of kids who, you know, flatly, I mean, they arrived on paper as being failures or, you know, quote unquote, at risk or you know, fall off the table or fall between the cracks in high school, somehow kind of came together. We created a home for them. And to, to, to really see it kind of play out all these years later, uh, really kind of hit me like, yeah, I think that was even more special than, than we gave it credit for. But, you know, I, I think... That was one of those things, you know, the, the principal had a vision uh, and he put, you know, four or five people at the counter, uh, dedicated counselor, you know, very much on the case of uh, kids who are in this situation and how do they not get lost in the school. And, and we chose to to make them not get lost by by giving them each other, you know, and and man, they they just really rose to it. Yeah. Well, and I'm so glad you shared that example because. For so many of our kids, you know, we can lose them easily if if we're not doing things to help them get better. And that piece of recognizing that they needed community because we all need it 
and someone to have their back in that situation very literally. And, you know, it's not like we're saying, yes, you should go build community so kids will beat up other kids. That's not the case at all. But that's exactly. that was that was how they knew how to deal with that and make sure that they were supporting someone. So surely you taught them other skills and they're not still jumping people that make them upset today when they're right. 30. Right. <laughs> and so, right. so, so that, that idea of giving them community when the easier thing would have been to just kick them out of school and have them, you know, be a dropout, which seems like the path they were on. Instead, you did this little thing to give them a sense of community and there were bumps along the way and you still have this great story of them getting better and staying close even to this day, which, you know, I say that's a success. And going back to that idea of, of seeing how kids are outside of high school yeah, after their K-12 experience, I think that needs to be done a lot more so that we can see whether or not the things that we're doing actually worked. And a story on that, I had a, a student who I thought absolutely hated school. And she wrote me a letter uh, later saying that it was the best schooling she had ever had. And I was like, wait, best what? <laughs> That's the best ever. That is the best yeah. ever. Yep. I wrote a review for a, a book earlier this year. And I, I, I used the term earlier, like uh, deeper learning, because I, I wrote a review for a book that appeared in Education Next. It was called In Search of Deeper Learning. And it was kind of a very talked about book. But that was one of the things that I pointed out in the in the uh, review that I wrote was it's kind of strange that all we're doing when we look for deeper learning is, is I think a lot of people go into the classroom and look for deeper teaching or their concept of deeper teaching. It's like, you know, that those things might make us feel good. They might, you know, they might say this class is definitely experiencing deeper learning. And you say, how do they know? And then, well, the kids were talking the whole time. I'm like, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's, it's whether, you know, like, like the kids who are exposed to an environment like that regularly really succeed in the later steps of their life. Um, I would, I would just maintain that to the, to the end of me. And again, I, I did, I don't have limitless resources, you know, like I don't, I'm not a highly funded person or anything like that. And so I couldn't do this really robust look, but you know, I did gather up lots and lots of kids that I once upon a time touched through this you know, initiative. I uh, was able to survey them, was able to interview several of them, dozens of them. Uh, and, uh, and through that was like, wow, you know, that's, that's when I could ask them, you know, what was memorable? What based on the person you were back then, you know, did really uh, looking back on it. Uh, and now as an adult and with kids, with jobs, you know, how did it, how would you say it helped? And so, uh, and I know Jethro, that probably sounds like, like it's a lot of books in one <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> and it kind of and it, and it is. Uh, uh, but it just kind of worked out that way. Uh, that is a small piece of, you know, it was a very local intervention. It impacted a, a pretty limited number of kids, if we're, if we're honest. Uh, but that was a very data-driven decision, okay? Like, like we looked at our school data over time. And basically, uh, what our, uh, we didn't, our principal did, totally his vision. And what he realized was any of the kids, like two almost like, and it was, I can't remember the figure. Um, and he couldn't either when I interviewed but uh, his name's Bob Perdames, by the way. I think he's uh, still my mentor to this day. Uh, he was like, we we found with, uh, and it was with incredible reliability, like like eighty five to ninety percent of our kids who didn't graduate or didn't graduate on time, you could trace it back to the number of credits they earned or didn't earn in their sophomore year. It was a ten through twelve, by the way. So that that was the model of that high school at the time. And so he was like, he was hell bent on on like finding the kids who would not hit that threshold before they didn't hit that threshold and making sure they had the tools to at least reach the threshold before they left the 10th grade. And that's how the sophomore academy became the sophomore academy. So it was a very data-driven decision. Uh, and then he tasked four people with it and we had kind of a school within a school, but it was one small thing that impacted a small group of kids gave them the sense of community you talk about, gave them a place to, 
to, well, they hated it at first because they basically walked into a land of a lot more rules and things like that. <laughs> like, yeah, but, like yeah. we were, we were much more stringent on, uh, basically to say, listen, on paper, you don't present a very good case that you're going to do well here. But where a lot of big high schools will just let you like fade, we are not going to tolerate it. And here's how we're going to do it. And then darn it, they, they ended up beating other kids up <laughs> to make sure yeah. they were safe as a group. Yeah. Not gonna get, and again, not a message that we reinforced. And we certainly had to teach them out of that at the same time. It was like, yeah, it was, as you say, it was like, it was their way of expressing their loyalty to one another. Uh, that I'm that, yeah, it was, it was a little primitive. It was a little, it was a little like not where we want them to go, but okay, guys, like, like we love that you love each other. Okay. Now don't do that again. And let's like, let's use that energy to power you to, you know, like, like being the best person you can. Okay. Uh, and I, and there's, there's passages in the book too, where the kids uh, said to me, and I, I wasn't really aware of this. Uh, they were actually uh, kind of afraid heading out of sophomore year that we won't have this. Yeah. You know? Wow. Uh, we won't, we won't have that. Who will, who will care for us like this? And it was like, and that, you know, we made further adjustments to say, all right, we can't, we can't guarantee that this group stays together all the way through high school. That's like impossible according to our master schedule. But we then arranged to like, uh, uh, I'm not sure you have the uh, advisory, you like a homeroom. Heard of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like advisory or homeroom, we basically structured it. So the same kids would be together for four years. Uh, so we would still maintain touch with them. Uh, and so that was like, cause we hadn't thought of that, you know, we hadn't thought of that the first year, uh, but that was an adjustment that we made is like, yeah, man, we don't, we don't just want to send them out into the woods now, you know, like we, we did this and, and maybe right their course a tiny bit. Um, uh, but how do we maintain that all the way through? And and, and that was one way we, we found out how to install. Yeah. So a 2007 study from the university of Chicago said that mm -hmm. if students fail just one core class their freshman year they're four times less likely to graduate from high school on time Absolutely. and and i'm quoting that like i just knew that off the top of my head but i ironically just today read an article about that yeah. because i am i'm looking at our failure rates at our school in our district here and saw that one fourth of our students in high school failed a class in the first semester of the school yeah. year which is just ridiculous. And that is, and you're onto something incredibly important because that, I mean, like where we were, and again, I, all glory to my principal, Bob Bernames, but he was, he unearthed the same thing. And I think what was, what was also kind of in the water at the time for administrators was this idea of that's, that's where it happens. Like when you, when you want to define at risk, however people may feel about that term, but that's what at risk means is like you are at risk of not graduating based on what's on paper. And he, he really realized that oh, now. And I, I have no idea what it's like in your own setting, but I know throughout the state, I know Texas has one for sure. Just from personal experience, I know that Minnesota has one. And I'm sure other states have them. They're called early warning systems that can, yeah, can really like flag like down to students, like demographic uh, characteristics that sometimes mean like, like, is it a one parent home? Are they, have they ever been on assistance? Are they okay? Like all those things go into, these are your early warning signs, basically that, that, you know, these students should maybe come attached with a red flag for some sort of extra attention. Ours was a very rudimentary, like, you know, I mean, shoot, 2004, even standardized tests were, were kind of in their infancy. So like we weren't, we we had very little information to go on, so we used a very holistic system, kind of working with our feeder middle schools or high sorry junior highs at the time, uh, and we would uh, we would basically survey counselors and teachers from the junior highs and say, you know, with these very holistic questions like, in your estimation, who's going to struggle once they get here? Okay, so then we would take that, we would harvest all that information, and we would lay it on top of standardized test data, and then we'd basically pick out our best set of kids okay like who who seems to, who seems to be the most quote unquote at risk and why and then and then piece together our classes like that um 
Uh, and then we only had like two sections a year that we could dedicate to it because all of us were teaching other things. Like I was uh, English 11 and regular 10 as well. So like, you know, so, so we had to massage all that, but, uh, but that's kind of how we did it is, is well before the days of early warning systems. But I think districts, even today, they could use the much more sophisticated systems to, to piece together the best classes and, and do, do as you say, which is really target kids who like, okay, we have some warning that, that there are kids who are going to need a little something else. It's finding the right little something else. That's the trick. Yeah, well, I would definitely recommend people check out the book. It's called What the Academy Taught Us, Improving Schools from the Bottom Up in a Top-Down Transformation Era. And it is a hefty book, almost 500 pages, uh, which I would expect from you who said that you can't do close notes on anything. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's to be expected. But uh, Sorry, man. Sorry. The, yeah, that's, that's how it is. So the last question I ask, Eric, is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative leader like you? Wow. That's a great question. One thing I would definitely recommend is a book. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm going to try to get it down to one book, Daniel Willingham. Okay. Daniel Willingham. Uh, I, I talked a lot about cognitive science. I talked a lot about like decision-making, uh, things like that. Uh, I would recommend that every principal read every book by Daniel Willingham. But if there's one I really wish they'd read, uh, it's called When Do You Trust the Experts or When Can You Trust the Experts? Uh, and it's basically a book about how do you make better evidence-based decisions? Okay, so uh, Dr. Willingham works in cognitive psychology. He, he really does a lot on, you know, like how we learn and things like that. But, but the second book that he wrote uh, is about how, how and why we make the decisions we do. Uh, and he provides like a, no, a number of really great uh, filters that decision makers can push their decisions through before they make any decisions. Uh, and that's one of those things I just really, I think everyone everywhere uh, would be really wise to, to, to think about why I make the decisions I do before they go out and, and even start, you know, looking at classrooms, talking to teachers, or anything like that, you know? Uh, and, and one of the reasons I think it's really important for principals, especially in this top down transformation era uh, is because they are kind of the, the front line when it comes to their district leadership to say, why are we doing this? Okay. So, so a district that as, as you and I talked about or a little bit earlier, I think before we were on the, on the cast, a district that decides it's uniformly going to do the same thing for everybody. When the say 10 principals in that district or shoot some of the districts I've worked with 70 principals, uh, if they can be kind of maybe, you know, pushing upward a little bit, like, why are we doing this? You know. I think Dan Willingham's second book, When Can You Trust the Experts, uh, is, a, is a great thing for all school leaders to look at because it can, one, help with some of the decisions they make at their building level, but then definitely help them with kind of pushing upward on, on the more, you know, intrusive, <laughs> for lack of a better word, but intrusive, like centrally driven improvements. Yeah. And I hate to say, I hate to say, like, but like how do you improve? read a book. Okay. But if I could, that's one thing I wish all principals were armed with some of the tools that Dr. Willingham uh, brings up in that book. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that that's, that is a good suggestion. You can get a link to that book at transformativeprincipal.org slash episode three, three, four. So thank you again, Eric, for being part of transformative principal. Um, how do people get in contact with you if they want to learn more from you or connect with you? Uh, I think the best way would, I, I have a blog, it's called the total ed case. Uh, uh, but I think probably the best way would be just, you know, follow on Twitter or just take a look on there just cause I'm, I'm reasonably active on there. It's a, it's a great way, for, especially for the research ed community to kind of plug in. So that's, I'm, I spend a decent amount of time there per day. So. Okay. Anyone who follows, if you're free to direct message me, I'm, I always respond. Great. That sounds good. Thanks again for being part of Transformative Principle. And once again, those show notes are available at transformativeprincipal.org slash episode 334. Thank you to our valued partner, John Cat Educational. If you are a leader looking to make transformative change, 
by providing yourself and your teachers with professional development that is research-based and rigorous, yet easy to digest and full of practical strategies, check out the latest publications from John Cat. Visit us.johncatbookshop.com to find information or learn more in our show notes.